Hey guys, EST here with another great video and I thought, let's make another gun video. And you might be thinking, but you're on YouTube. I don't think they're too friendly to that, but I mean, this is extremely educational. They've never really had a problem with my channel. And because of that, one of my best performing videos is about gun calibers. If you want to know just calibers, so size of the bullet and cartridge, go check out that video. So I'm not going to repeat much of the info from there, but we are going to touch on it. So, um, home defense, there's a lot that goes into it. We're talking size, barrel length, weight, storage. Reliability, ammo capacity, um, wall penetration. There is so much to think about, and I'm going to touch on all of it. So if you're like a first-time gun buyer, you know, you, you, you bought one recently but haven't watched a lot of gun stuff on, on YouTube or whatever, well, you're in the majority and you found the right video. And out of all the possible areas of gun knowledge, I would say suppressors are probably number one when it comes to just the sheer level of misconceptions of the general populace but a very close number two is just home defense in general or home defense people because if you think about it i own like eight or nine guns at the moment the fact that i don't know probably tells you exactly where i'm at i buy and sell a lot i go to the range i watch gun content on youtube and i have a lot of training you know I, i'm a gun guy but i don't ask me gun history to identify certain models or to really do any kind of gunsmithing okay that's i'm not that level of gun guy but i know what i'm talking about i can clean and use the average gun so yeah so for every one of me there's got to be 10 times minimum probably higher of people who are like new gun owners first time gun owners where they bought a gun three years ago stuffed it in a closet and they're good hopefully they went to the range and fired it at least once but i know depending upon where everybody lives you know maybe that's not a thing but do try to get there at least every six months and practice with your gun because if you can't hit what you're aiming at and don't remember how to operate the gun it's probably more of a liability if somebody breaks into your house or wild animals attacking something outside or whatever so number one i just want to touch on the laws this would be a 10 hour video. And by the time I'm done making it, one of the laws would have changed. So all I'm going to say is research official sources on gun laws. And there's also really good websites out there with like databases on this stuff about duty to retreat, stand your ground. Um, what can you do this? What is considered a deadly weapon here? Can you run back into a house if you know somebody's in it? In almost all 50 states, no, by the way. In almost all 50 states, if your kid's inside and you see evidence that somebody broke in, like a kicked in door and somebody moving inside, but you better have a pretty good lawyer. So there's all kinds of little nuanced things like what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. Try to study up on those. It doesn't take very long. Maybe 30 minutes of reading on a couple websites and you'll probably have it. But everything is different in your area. And I've actually heard so many different versions of so many different laws from so many different sources uh, about like, well, here it is in my area that I kind of confused it in my head. And I find myself commonly forgetting in my state what is and isn't legal. So for those of you still watching who are like pretty adept gun owners with a lot of knowledge, first of all, I challenge you to watch the whole video and see if there's something you didn't know about. And secondly, yeah, don't let that happen. It, if it happened to me, it could happen to you. So, I mean, I would say brandishing what's considered a lethal threat and stand your ground versus retreat. Those are the big, big, big ones to look up. Know them, memorize them, take notes, review your notes, because just a local text file on your computer is a lot more reliable than bookmarking stuff and hoping the website is still there. But yeah, definitely get knowledgeable on that. So let's talk about wall penetration. So what rounds go through walls and what ones don't? Well, after watching all kinds of tests where like professional actual drywall and like home construction people built an accurate wall and then put like a pig carcass behind it or ballistics gel or I mean, I've seen probably a dozen of these tests. I compared it to like some FBI data and okay, this is going to get really complicated. Are you ready? I'm going to list off which calibers can go through a wall and kill somebody behind them, which ones can't. All common gun calibers. I'll give you a second to write that down. I know it's really complicated. Even a nine millimeter hollow point will go through the average house wall if it doesn't hit, you know, a stud, which I mean, they're what every two feet. Yeah. The probability is pretty low to hit a stud and be lethal to the person behind it. And nine millimeter hollow point is about as low as you get. I mean, there's what 380, which is like a short nine mil. I think I've even seen those go a couple inches into ballistic gel after sailing through a wall. So getting caught in insulation or having like some abnormal type of waterproof drywall, like bathroom grade, I know that can change it, but it's a lot safer to just think that generally every single common round nine mil on up, especially rifles will go through at least one wall. Now a 5.56 five, or 223, the most common um, AR-15 round or a 308, the most uh, common deer hunting round. I'm sure I'll get some comments about that. We'll go through multiple walls that you might be in your neighbor's house at that point. So just in general, I would not recommend is especially if you live in an apartment, a full-size rifle for home defense. So all the arguments for a rifle are just ammo capacity and stopping. 
you hit someone with a rifle round, they are going down. Like, a, a pistol, I've seen people get shot multiple times and still get right back up or not even fall down, not even feel it. Depends if they're on drugs. But the stopping power of 9mm isn't great, but bigger um, pistol calibers... They don't really provide much. I did cover this very heavily in multiple other videos, but there's just no good reason to get 45 ACP. If you look at like lethality, initial hydrostatic shock and, you know, energy imparted and stuff, it's 10, 20% higher. It's basically nothing. I'd rather just have like two more uh, rounds to fire out of a nine millimeter because you can fit more in the weapon. The ammo's cheaper. It's easier to find. It's not like nobody runs 45, but if you're going to get a pistol, get a pistol, and 45 and 9mm both sail through a wall about the same. 45 is a little bit wider, but it's a little bit uh, more energy and more powder behind it, so it's, it's almost a wash. So that's pistols. Um, pistols versus rifles, though. I mean, an AR-15 compared to a 9mm, I think it's roughly five times the energy, and then the bullet is longer, pointier, and narrower. It is built to go through things. Okay, it's built to fly further, I should say. It's a coincidence that it goes through things. It's somewhat by design. But people say, well, okay, I, I've got a 9 mil and it's, you know, 8 rounds. I've got an AR-15, boom, 30 rounds. So if multiple people break into my house or whatever, I want the maximum amount. Well, if you live alone and you're not in an apartment, sure, AR-15 for home defense, but still, it's really big and you're going to bonk the barrel on stuff, especially in the dark. Oh, it's easier to put a flashlight on. I mean, yeah, my gun isn't flashlight compatible. My main, you know, carry gun. But, okay, you can put a flashlight on a pistol and a rifle, but you can put multiple sights and this and that. Okay, let's not go too mall ninja with your rifle. That's just a general tip. You can set it up really right, and you can set it up really wrong. If you want to do something exotic, at least go to the range and test it, make sure stuff doesn't fall off, and make sure it works the way you think. But, I mean, a, a, a pistol, you can suck it right into your chest. You can hold it, you know, long, short, whatever. You're going through doorways. It's pretty ideal until you run out of ammo. So, yes, the ammo thing is big, but a lot of common pistols that you would be more, eh, I'm going to the range, I'm, you know, staging it inside my house, not, oh, I'm carrying it every day, are going to be a, like, double stack where the, the ammunition zigzags in the mag to fit more instead of just a straight up and down one. They're wider, they're heavier, and they're very hard to carry, depending upon model, but generally they can hold, like, 17 plus 1 is probably the most common. So one in the chamber, 17 in the mag, and then you can put another mag right next to it. Because if you're not carrying it, why not? There's a big debate about should you carry a second or third magazine on you when you, you're carrying a pistol, concealed. I would say generally no because of the inconvenience and the weight, but tactically, I think it's fairly tactically sound. So do what you want, but don't think that you absolutely have to. That, that's where I would leave it. Oh, and I guess personally I don't. But for home defense, if you're just going to put the gun somewhere in a closet, in a, you know, a hidden thing on the wall, under your couch, whatever's away from kids, because you are legally liable for if a kid grabs it and does something stupid with it, or a guest in your house steals it, you're liable in most locations. So hidden, safe, locked, but you can get to it as quickly as possible. Whatever the, the cross index between all those is, really, really think about where to put it and what to put it in and how it's locked and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, okay, so it's staged somewhere. Put all the mags you want. I mean, a lot of guns these days come with two or three mags brand new in the box anyway. So don't just think, well, okay, I've got an 8-rounder or a 17-rounder. I'll just get the 17-rounder not bother with a second magazine. If it's in your house, how big is a magazine? Like, where are you hiding it? You know, I guess if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But other than that, put two more mags next to it. Why, why not? Like, what's the harm, you know? There's almost no reason to not have an extra mag loaded and sitting there. And people will say, don't leave mags loaded, it damages the springs. Um, that was true about 40 years ago. That's, that's like the super short version of it. Modern guns, you should be fine. Molded plastic, like bonded AR-15 mags, you will not. I, I left one in storage for two years and then touched it and it spewed out all the ammo because it started separating. But that's a rifle mag, it's under a ton of pressure, it's bigger, and uh, it wasn't from a great brand. There's another hot tip for you. Whatever you buy, the gun, the ammo, the everything, get a good brand. So if you can get a rifle with 30 rounds that you're probably not going to need to fire that many in the average scenario, but we're not going for probably. People drive me nuts when they're like, well, according to these statistics in the average gunfight, X amount of uh, rounds were fired. Well, according to you walking out your front door, there's like a 0.01% chance that you're going to need to pull out your gun and fire it. We don't carry a gun because of probability, okay? It's, it's a just-in-case, maybe fringe situation thing already, so you might as well, within reason, prepare for the less common scenarios as well. So for a carry gun, number one is it has to be concealed. Otherwise, you're going to make people uncomfortable. You're going to get kicked out of places. It's going to be nonstop problems. And anybody who can tell that you're carrying one might, you know, try to steal it. 
And if you're open carrying because you're a clueless macho idiot, then you're about to get somebody walking up behind you just grabbing it and running. I, I, I could show probably 15 clips right now, just filmed this year, of people doing that. Do not open carry. There is absolutely no reason to do it unless you're, what, hunting or, I, I don't know, live in rural Virginia. I, I don't know. I've heard some things where it's like, oh, everybody does that. Well, if everybody's cool, cool. But, like, I don't know you. I don't know why you have that gun. So I'm not, yeah, pro 2 I am like, oh, I'm going to walk to the other side of the store because I don't know you. I don't know how trained you are. I don't know your mental state. Don't open carry. Yes, I'm, I'm going to leave that in a video about home defense. <laughs> you know why? Because I hate open carry people. They're just macho, clueless idiots who need training. Anyway, 17 round pistol versus 30 round rifle. I, I'm going to say pistol when it just comes to how many realistically you're going to have to fire, but keep an extra mag near it because you can just throw it in your pocket. I guess keep it in your hand if you want to fire one handed, but... I would much rather have two hands on the gun aiming it properly so that the first shots hit the target instead of, oh, I'm just going to spam ammo because it, you know, if eventually one might hit them. And is it going to scare them? Yes. But somebody who breaks in with a fake gun or a knife or something, all of a sudden somebody's pointing a gun in their face and then, you know, start firing. If they had zero intention of ever using their gun, it's just because, oh, I'm committing a crime. I might as well have a gun in case I have to subdue someone or scare them off or in case I get shot at, but otherwise I'm not pulling it out and firing it which a lot of actually criminals have that mindset, at least professionals, not ones on drugs who are desperate and don't think or horribly violent, deranged people, you better ensure that your first shots hit them. So accuracy is key. It's not just, oh, somebody's in my house. I'm going to just unload on them because I have plenty of ammo. Not a very good strategy. You are going to scare the crap out of them, but they will either run, which is great, or they'll try to draw from the drop and return fire because they have no other option. Especially if they're like cornered, they can't get past you. They're in a room, they can't get out the window and you're in the doorway. Well, you're going to get shot at. So initial shots hitting the target or targets, that is key. That is the most important thing in any gunfight anywhere, almost universally. Ask anyone. So accuracy, an accurate pistol, which is why you don't buy some little, you know, stubby, short revolver, short barrel piece of crap that fits in your purse, but is an accurate past like 10 feet, you know? Or something with horrible sights or, God, pistols with no sights. I've seen that. That's a thing. Oh, it was cheap, but it's a glorified 50-year-old pirate gun. No. The sights are crooked, but it's fine because I only have to fire seven yards in my house. No. Black sights with no white or green dots on them or no fiber optics. Or night glow sights. No. Those are all things you really want to avoid with a pistol. So if you see one where it's like, oh, the sights aren't even painted on. I just saw one at the gun store yesterday. It was actually a 22 rifle. And I'm like... Do you just paint them on yourself? What? What? Do I have to get out a bottle of whiteout and brush it on just so I can fire this thing vaguely in the dark? My gosh, like I'm cheap when it comes to gun models, but I'm not stupid. So as far as optics, I mean, red dot or not, I would say red dot, but it's, it's less crucial than, you know, trying to make a 25 yard shot outdoors. That's when you really are going to need a red dot unless you're an expert iron sight marksman. Inside your house, as long as it's good iron sight's cool... But it's not like you're less accurate with a, a, a red dot. Now, a red dot or any kind of hollow sight or really any kind of optic on a pistol at all, in my opinion, generally makes the average gun too big to carry without somebody seeing it under your shirt because it just pops off and sticks out like a sore thumb. You can do it. The right holster, you can cover it. Okay, cool. But I think that's kind of out for carry, and it's not very often that you have to hit somebody at you know 25 to 50 yards with a pistol. Nor could people like under attack or stopping a, a, a shooter, you know, an active shooter probably be able to hold it without their hands vibrating from adrenaline and, and find the red dot and you'll just do it automatically. Now with enough training and not much training, you can get that good. And if you have the right mental state, you could just switch it off and do what you need to do for a little bit until you really, you know, start shaking. So that's cool. But inside of a house, I mean, iron sights are fine. You, you could actually kind of Take a little less time to aim. I know that's going to be controversial. But okay, if I'm firing seven yards and I want to nail a bullseye, a little like half inch or one inch bullseye at the range with my pistol, I'm going to really line up those iron sights, make sure the left right is good, the float is good, the up down is good, and then probably be able to nail it. A person is what, like 18 inches wide? If the front sight is between the rear sights on the average iron sight pistol, you are going to hit them. You could probably not look down the sights and hit them. I wouldn't recommend that unless, you know, you're in a really weird situation or like, your hand is injured or, you know, whatever. But it's not hard to, to hit somebody at in-home range. But speaking of that topic, would I get one with a laser? Absolutely. Why not? It gives away your position a little bit, but, like, 
So do footsteps, so do opening doors. I mean, are you going to ambush someone? You're going to sneak up on them and, and then shoot them before they, you can even see if they have a weapon. But if they're carrying a gun and it's silent and they haven't detected you yet when they're like maximum listen, first of all, how did you know they were there? And then also no lights on and they, it's, that's a little too Hollywood movie for me. So you know what? Put a laser on it because then you, you don't even have to look down the sights necessarily. You can just laser is on person, fire done. If it's accurate and sighted in. It makes it a lot easier, and from you know experts with a lot more rounds down range than me, I've heard lasers are really, really, really good. They just don't work in the light, but that's fine. If you can get a laser and a flashlight, go for it. Now, we're, we're talking a little bit bigger pistol now, but you can get pretty compact frames. I think I've seen either factory original, but like a special version or an aftermarket one of my carry gun that has a flashlight and a, a light on it. Otherwise, Glocks, you can get all kinds of Glocks with that. But you can get pretty good clip-on stuff, too. So the ideal pistol, and I didn't say gun because we're going to get to that, the ideal pistol to me for home defense would be any kind of double stack mid to large size pistol, 9mm, with at least a flashlight so that you can, you know, basically see what you're shooting at, identify targets, and blind someone so that it's harder for them to fire back at you. And then if you can, put a laser on it too, and if you really want, red dot, why not? You're probably not going to be able to use it in the average scenario, but I mean, more accuracy, more better. Okay, cool. I just wouldn't drop a hundred bucks on a good one when you could drop it on something else. I'd rather put it into a security system and take a hundred out of the gun budget. Just saying, put some contact breaker, magnetic, like window alarms. It's like 10 bucks to do all the windows in your house or like 20, I guess. I don't know how big your house is. So that is an absolutely fantastic setup because, um, maneuverability, not a 28 inch you know, long barrel shotgun banging that around and trying to get, you know, clear your house and get through doorways and you're up, you're down. You're going to be hitting that on everything. Some kind of long sniper style rifle, completely unnecessary, harder to aim up close, and it's going to go through multiple walls. That is like the opposite of, of the ideal choice. But rifles are rifles, way higher stopping power, way scarier. You can put more accessories on them and higher ammo capacity. Plus it's more useful outside your house and you can use it at longer ranges. So it's like the ultimate, you know, dual purpose or triple purpose or all purpose gun compared to a pistol, which is very limited and it's only meant to be carried. You know, as far as like in a war, would anybody pick up a pistol over a rifle? Absolutely not, unless they had to. That's why they're considered backup weapons. I mean, a, a, a good decent rifle is like seven, $800 and a good decent pistol, I'll say 450. So if you're only going to buy one gun, you're not going to drop a thousand on, you know, one each. Would I say rifle? That is such a tough decision that I'm not going to make it. And I'm just going to say, buy a shotgun. I know you gun adept people have been screaming at your screen for the last 10 minutes. Shotguns are what you buy for home defense. The end period. I mean, yeah. Okay. The average shotgun could hold four or five shells. That is not a lot of shots. Oh, I'm going to forget to circle back to this. Don't buy a revolver. Six shots. Not enough. Yes. You can buy an eight round revolver. Great. If you're going to buy a pistol, get a double stack, get one that can fire, you know, 11 plus rounds, preferably 17 plus one. Six rounds is not enough for everything. It, you're, you're running real thin. Oh, but, but they don't jam. Yes, they don't jam, but ask anyone who rents guns at a range or has fired every firearm known to man. They will tell you, they've been in my comment section reaffirming this, that this is widespread knowledge here. Revolvers do have problems as much or more so than a, a modern semi-automatic cylinder alignment and like just weird hammer problems and generally to me the average revolver isn't very safe yeah they got like crossbar safeties and stuff but it's like more to think about more to worry about instead of just it's loaded rack the slide pew 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 okay great they take longer to reload um the calibers are bigger but you don't need bigger when it comes to pistol because it'll just go through a wall more Th there's just no reason to buy a revolver i'm gonna catch some flack for that but those people are wrong and i'm probably gonna delete their comments they're harder to carry if you gotta conceal them it's don't buy a revolver. So shotguns, even less ammo, but you do not need to shoot somebody more than once with a shotgun. I don't care if it's a slug, a shell full of buckshot, even birdshot at that distance. Oh boy. The lethality rate, if you shoot somebody within like 10 yards with buckshot is they are not living unless you mostly miss and a little bit of the shot gets them. And not just lethality, because who cares? I only care about stopping power. I'd, I'd rather tase somebody than shoot them in almost any scenario if I knew the taser was 100% effective, which it is absolutely not. Closer to 50% statistically. Because the stopping power of a taser, what would be higher than that? Probably a headshot with a 50 cal, I guess? They probably aren't getting back up after that. They're probably dropping instantly. Other than that, they are doing absolutely nothing. So initial impact, shock, hydrostatic shock, nerve disruption, um... 
whatever you want to consider it, initial stopping power, just the threat is incapacitated. Shotguns, absolutely shotguns. With buckshot or a slug, you're looking at even higher initial shock and just dropping power than like a, a good hollow point rifle round. Now, a slug can go, what is it, like three, 400 feet and it just drops and hits the ground because they're not aerodynamic really at all. I mean, they're round, but that's about all it has going for it. So that's cool, but it'll just absolutely blast through a wall. Now, a rifle does have higher wall penetration than a shotgun slug, I will say that. And uh, there's been some pretty good results with number four, instead of double og, buckshot for home defense. Um, sometimes number four doesn't go fully through a wall. But remember the golden rule from earlier in this video, everything above a 22, every caliber will go through a wall, period, the end. If there's someone behind it, they are not safe. So number four buckshot, I, I've heard at distances, it can have trouble going through like winter jackets, leather, that kind of stuff. But you got to wonder how short barrel that was. I've looked at the energy. Basically a number four is equivalent to like a, a small pistol caliber. And the other thing to consider is the average uh, double log buckshot is I think nine pellets per shell usually. So, okay, inside a house, you're not going to get a very good spread, but you can get like a, a rifled barrel or like a, a choke that spreads it out a little bit. Not a terrible idea, but I like tight shots and a shotgun is already wider than just a single, you know, pistol or rifle bullet. So like, how wide do you want to go? And if you really want wide, you're going to have to run an illegal weapon or, you know, pay the tax stamp for a sub 18 inch barrel. And then you better hope that somebody's not right behind your family member or something, because you're going to get both of them. So the, the ultra wide, like I don't even have to aim. How, let's just settle on like aim a little bit. Can we at least do that? But my point about double log versus uh, number four buckshot is that number four tends to have, I think, upwards of like 27 pellets. I wouldn't say that they necessarily spread out more. It depends on the shell and it depends on the, the rifling and the barrel and, you know, a bunch of other factors. But would I rather make slightly bigger holes in someone nine times or would I rather make slightly smaller holes in them 27 times? So I've got rifles, I've got pistols, I've got a shotgun. What would I do if I hear somebody breaking into my house? It's going to be the shotgun. So let, let's just go over my setup. Pistol grip, because why not? Shoulder stock, if you're a smaller person, you're not very strong, you're not very heavy, whatever. Those do not apply to me, but I will say we threw a three inch magnum in my pistol grip shotgun after firing a smaller slug and some low recoil and some full size buckshot, literally the same day, probably within five minutes. And uh, I was used to it jumping up, 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 because that's just how that one recoils. It was generally up. Well, I changed my grip very slightly, put it slightly more forward. And we thought, let's just see if this will fire three inch magnum slug. Cause I mean, the gun's spec for it, but let's see if I can handle it. Also, I bought some, I'm gonna use them. I was holding 100% up because I was expecting it to jump up because the last hundred shells I put through it did it. Slammed me right in the face, cut up my lip. Luckily I didn't lose any teeth or break my nose. It was right between it. I very much lucked out on that. If it hit me in the nose, I actually could have died. I remember that was not my first time firing anything. I think I had fired 15 different guns, probably 10,000 rounds at that point. Anybody can make a mistake. Pistol grips are not the safest thing in the world, but I would say the recoil was pretty reasonable for an average strong, big, you know, six foot tall person with low recoil. Uh, I always forget if it's Fiocchi or Fiocchi, forgive me. 1150 feet per second, number four, low recoil, under loaded. So you can actually see through it. It's like half loaded to the way it could be. Number four, buckshot shells. So number four, low recoil, Fiocchi 2.5 inch buckshot. That is what I use in my own pistol grip shotgun for home defense. I, I would say for the money, you probably can't do better than that. Home defense for just under, you know, 250 bucks, all things considered, not counting any kind of gun safe. Now people get real touchy about this because people like to defend their decisions because a lot of people did do research and settled on a different, you know, scenario or opinion than me. And yeah, the lethality and stopping power of, of four brings it right down from shotgun to like, ooh, are you really still using a shotgun? But go look up test fires with, with that into ballistic gel. Does that look like it would kill a person? Come on. It's still a shotgun. It's still a lot of pellets. I think those are like 14 or 21 or something. And even at 1140, those things are zipping. It's like getting shot by like a nine millimeter multiple times, all simultaneously. Like you're gonna stop someone with it, okay? It won't go through body armor, but who the hell is breaking into your house with body armor? And if they do, you know what? First of all, you could always run. Secondly, you probably have the drop on them. That's kind of the point. And third, just aim under the vest, stomach, groin, legs on down bulletproof vests in double quotes because that's not what they're really called are not magic but is it even on my radar that somebody in a, in like full body armor would break into my house no am i even vaguely prepared for it not really i'll just aim lower and hope for the best or just absolutely unload all five shells on them and hope it knocks them on their butt 
might might phase them for a little bit just saying so that i wouldn't say because the, the solution to that is basically armor piercing which is uh, touchy subject a lot of armor piercing stuff is illegal in some places that's all i'm gonna say and also do you really want it to go through more walls the problem with the shotgun is that if i fire all five shells i'm in trouble also i don't leave it loaded to go for like five plus one because chambered shotguns almost across the board are pretty universally unsafe. Even modern shotguns are not tip or drop safe. So you tip them over, you drop them, they can and probably will fire. And you might think, oh, well, non-drop safe guns, what is it, 1940? But a lot of old revolvers, even still a lot of modern revolvers, and an enormous amount of shotguns, regardless of age, are not drop safe. And it's kind of hard to research whether they are or aren't. Usually it's just some guy on a forum saying it is or isn't and not from the manufacturer because they aren't touching that. Because as soon as they say it's not, somebody will drop it off a building and it'll fire. But the thing about not keeping one in the chamber is, yeah, I got to pump it and that'll alert them to my presence. It's pretty loud. And no, racking a shotgun is going to make them run off. It's going to make them pull their weapon and fire at you. That is a complete and utter myth. It might work some of the time. It's not going to work all the time. But you know what? Opening my door and walking out, it is loud enough for them to hear me in dead silence. So uh, we're going to rack the shotgun and then blind them with the flashlight that's on it. So... I can see what they're doing, I can see if they're reaching for a gun or already have one, and I can make a firing decision in, you know, half a second tops, probably less. And one shot from a shotgun is going to stop them. Here's the thing, though. If you're going to have a shotgun indoors, in an enclosed area, if you think a pistol is loud, try firing a shotgun indoors. I have done it once, and that was enough. Oh, actually, no, my uh, the one gun range is all concrete. Okay, I've done it a hundred times. Didn't get any better. My ears were ringing through 33 decibel reduction ballistic grade... Uh, earplugs. And if you're about to say, we'll use the over ears, the average over ears that I've seen are not 33 decibel reduction. They're like 28. I think I saw some sold at the gun range that were 21. There's another fun myth for you. Oh, earplugs. We're using earplugs. Use the over ears. They're better. Well, they're not. You can get better ones, but not by much. So always, 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 always have ballistic grades. So I think, what is it? 28 decibels or higher reduction, which is almost every one you could buy anywhere. But, um, okay. Acoustic ones wouldn't work. And the, the wear them while you're sleeping ones, sometimes those are 15. So ballistic capable earplugs, put them right next to your gun, put them in every gun case, put them in every emergency go bag. And if you're going to carry a shotgun, just put them in. Uh, it, yeah. You aren't going to be able to hear people rustling around and hear footsteps and stuff as much, but if you're basically incapacitated after the first shot, you better hope that you hit them. And for shotguns, you you cannot power through it. The end period. If you are not wearing ear pro, you are getting one shell and that's it before you have to recover for a couple seconds. The other thing is your ears are going to be ringing for a while. So when the cops show up or your neighbors show up or, or your wife comes out of the bedroom and is like, what's going on? You'll be lucky if you can hear them talking. I, I actually know somebody. This is a famous story. Somebody got shot. It was a really old guy. Had to use his firearm to defend his home. The cops were called, or he called the cops or something. They showed up and he couldn't hear them issuing commands to drop it, and they shot him and killed him. And remember, old people have worse hearing than younger people. So if anybody's going to recover quicker from a, a shotgun blast, I would think it would be them. I mean, still, it's like the pressure wave and stuff, but just the sheer volume, it's less loud to them so like i said nobody can power through a shotgun blast inside of a house with walls in an enclosed area so there's no point in owning a shotgun for home defense unless you're going to put your plugs next to it i cannot stress that enough also i have i must phrase this incorrectly i have fired a gun indoors as a controlled test not at a person those of you from my other YouTube channel know exactly what I was doing. I never said it wasn't something stupid. I said I, I didn't fire the gun accidentally. But what I did do accidentally is not put one of my ears in. My ears were ringing for like 30 minutes and that was a 9mm pistol. And it was a pretty open area. I mean, it wasn't like, it, it would be like like the size of an average living room in a very large house. And still, like, I, it stunned me for like two or three seconds. I had to kind of recompose myself to take the follow-up shots. And put my ears back in. And remember, I had one ear plug in. My hearing in that ear has, has not quite been 100% since then. So ear protection. It's like $4, people. Come on. Put that next to whatever it is. I don't care if it's the smallest pistol. If you're going to say, well, 22, no, 22 indoors is going to snap. Okay. You might be able to power through that. Nine millimeter, maybe if adrenaline was going, but you're going to feel really bad afterwards. So you're, if you're going to think I'm going to play Mr. Ninja and have, you know, perfect hearing and then I'll, I'll just fire if I absolutely have to. Oh, well. But yeah, I mean, flashing around a flashlight and just seeing what's going on is going to be better than hearing. Because hearing, you're like, oh, I hear something. Something is moving. I don't know if it's a person, an animal, whatever. Oh, it's a, a big dark shape. What is this? Is this friendly? Is this a drunk person that went into the wrong house? Or is this a home intruder or a secret assassin? 
you don't know. I, I'd rather have earplugs in and be all set and ready to fire without basically flashbanging myself and just use my eyes. Now, I'd probably put them in and then just kind of, like for the foam earplugs, you can kind of pull them out a little bit and then you can just like tap them to put them back in. And it kind of like lowers it a little bit. You can still hear, it, like you basically insert them like a quarter of the way, pull them out a little bit or just whatever. Just have one like half in. And then you'd at least be able to hear if something's screaming. But remember, 33 decibels, you can take a 100 decibel and 90 decibel scream and bring it down to still very, very audible. Also, not going to get too into it, but they're lying about the decibel reduction. Yeah, it'll probably reduce like 15 kilohertz to you know, by 33. Not like a 200 hertz voice, you know what I mean? So hearing protection is the number one most overlooked thing when it comes to home defense, regardless of what you pick for your gun. And that's why I wanted to really stress it and cover every little bit of it. So light, important. Sound, very secondary, but you need to protect your ears. Over penetration, just know what's behind it. If you got the time, I mean, if you got a fire, you got a fire, okay. The odds of hitting something behind something are pretty low, but like, you know, know where your kids' beds are. Know where the outside walls of your neighbor's house are or whatever. Know where the big, thick wooden fence is just in case. I mean, if they're pointing a gun at you, you got to take the shot. But, like, if you're going to line up a shot on someone that you're like, wow, they've got a knife in their hand or they're rummaging around in my jewelry drawer. Oh, but, you know, the bathroom's behind it if I take two steps to the left. And my kid's bedroom is behind them if I take two steps to the right. If you got all the time in the world, hey, and, and I mean, yeah, they got a knife and you could give them a verbal warning. I'm not going to just shoot somebody in the back of the head with a knife. You know, they might be desperate. They might be poor. They might be on drugs. I don't know. I know that with the gun on them and my finger on the trigger... I, if, if, if they turn around and, and do anything other than look shop and, uh, shocked and drop it, I'm going to hit them before they can take even a step. So train, 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 train until you can do that too. It doesn't take much training. And I, I guess I hit on this before, but I really want to drive it home. For legal reasons, not to mention moral reasons, identify your target before firing. There are so many stories of just, well, somebody was in my house. It was a row of uh, condos. They all looked the same and some you know, random retiree just walked into the wrong one because they all looked the same and it was night and somebody accidentally left the door open or they, they keyed all the, the doors the same. I've actually heard that story too. Boy, how lazy can you be? Or the contractor got bad notes. I don't know. Just because someone is in your house doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to fire at them. It's 100% nefarious. I've heard of drunk people stumbling in. I've heard of... People getting really messed up on mushrooms and climbing in the window, but they don't have a weapon. You can't, in almost any state in America, fire at someone and kill them just because they're in your house. Even if you're like 100% sure that they're not supposed to be there, still, it could have been an honest mistake. It could be an impaired person. It could be a, a mentally disabled person. Like, you are going to be in such deep crap if you fire at someone just because, well, they were in my house and they weren't supposed to. And you better take the plea deal if they didn't have a weapon on them. And if it's some 14-year-old who decides burglaries are a great source of income because they're not old enough to work at McDonald's and they have really bad parents or no parents, even if they have a knife on them, they're going to say, well, the person's, you know, 5'3", 90 pounds, you know. And the last two times they broke into a house and somebody heard them, they just ran off. And they didn't have the knife in their hand. And you shot them in the back. Boy, you better have a good lawyer. It's barely within the law, but the judge or the jury might not be too happy about that. So target identification, number one. Number two, know what you're going to do. You don't want to have these decisions made in the moment with seconds to spare while somebody is actively about to turn around and you don't know why they're there. If you're like, okay, black ski mask, they've got my laptop under their arm and a knife in the other hand. Are you going to say, you know what? Knife, thief, obvious, shoot them. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I, I've already said I personally would not do that. I will give anyone in my house with almost anything other than a gun up and at the ready a chance to drop it or run off because that's just, I'm, I'm not going to kill somebody unless, unless they're actually threatening my life, not legally, oh, I might be able to get away with, yeah, they were threatening my life. And a lot of people will say this and I, I do, I'm not going to say anything about it other than if you're alive to tell the story and they're not and there was a weapon on them. Some people will say, yeah, I'm going to say that he came at me with the knife. I'm going to say that there was a bit of a struggle. I'm going to say that I gave them five seconds to drop it and they didn't. And they started running towards me. I wouldn't recommend lying because forensics is pretty good right now. But people have said that. But those same people tend to say, oh, well, if I shoot somebody because they broke into my house, of course I'm going to shoot them. And then if it turns out they didn't have a weapon on them, I'm going to plant a gun on them or plant a knife on them. Sounds like a good way to get more charges. And like I said, the defense is always, well, they weren't alive to tell the tale, so I can tell the jury and the cops anything, and whatever I say is going to be true. If you don't have cameras, or witnesses, or, uh, you know. 
But how about we just don't do that? How about we only shoot people that deserve it and are actually threatening their safety? Now, you might think, somebody in my house with a weapon on them, a, a gun on their hip, a gun in their hand, a, a knife in their hand, that's enough of threatening my safety, and the law absolutely supports it. Okay. I just know with my skill level and how quickly I can fire and how I can make follow-up shots quick and I can run pretty fast, I could take almost anybody in a physical altercation. If it came to that, I also always have pepper spray on me no matter what I'm wearing. And there's some in my dresser, there's some on my bed, there's some in my living room. Oh, stage less than lethal. There, there's a fun little gem for you too. Am I going to give them a second chance to not get shot in my house and not have to hire a lawyer and spend the night detained or in holding or in prison all because, well, I just killed someone and the cops are still investigating. So they're not going to let me walk free because I could just leave if everything I said was a lie because there's not two people to tell the tale. So that cuts both ways. I don't want that drama. And plus, like, I think I could mentally handle it. I'm a pretty trained, hard, mentally tough person in general. If you've been watching my channel long enough, you know, I've been at a mass shooting really didn't affect me that much. Almost no, I had like two dreams about it. That was it. And I kept it in check. Did not have PTSD. But still, if I shot someone in my own house and then had to live in that house, no matter how bad they were and they're, they're threatening my life, they made their decision and I just prevented myself from dying by ending their life, oh well. Like, I, I think I'm already mentally there, but I wouldn't want to test it. The legal, the emotional, the, I mean, even cops who are trained for this kind of stuff, they have a total breakdown after shooting somebody. It's very common. It's actually more common than not, regardless of age, gender, anything. So you better ahead of time think, this scenario, am I going to shoot him? This scenario, am I going to shoot him? I'll tell you what, I don't have kids, but if I was sleeping over at my brother's house with his, you know, my nieces and nephews, his kids, and I heard a bump in the night and they, somebody walked past me and was, you know, walking up to their room, up the stairs, I'm going to follow them if I can't identify them and they keep walking or start running towards their room. I don't care if they have a weapon or not, I'm shooting in the back. I don't care. They're running towards kids' rooms. They are going to die. The end. That's weird. I don't care why they're there. And you know what? If it turned out there's some kind of mentally deranged, crazy person and they didn't have a weapon, it's going to look bad, but kid safety, okay? Most juries wouldn't convict. And you, you may recall something I said about two minutes earlier in the video. So I'm going to hint at. But you know what prevents these scenarios even more than, than thinking ahead of time, not freezing up. We're like, do I shoot him? Do I not? How will this look? What's the laws? Uh, what do I do? What do I do? And panic, freeze up. And then they turn around and you're like, oh, now they see me. Uh, fire, panic, fire. And it's just somebody who was in the wrong house. Well, it kind of goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Have really good door locks. Real, like deadbolts. We're talking good stuff, you know? Kick resistant or like fully kick proof. We're talking metal frames. We're talking those little door reinforcers. You can get them pretty cheap and install them yourself. If you're building a house or having it remodeled or you just bought it, one, rekey the locks. Oh my gosh, you don't know who has the keys. And even in an apartment, you can buy like, oh, well, I'm the only one here. Nobody needs to get in. Put one of those like little doorstop devices where you can only open the door like a little bit. Now, that's going to not help you get out if there's a fire. But if you always know it's there and you kind of run drills where you set your alarm for 3 a.m. and, you know... Have it pop up and say, there's a fire drill, ha ha ha. Get out as fast as you can. You just run over, grab it, throw the little door shim thing, and then uh, you know, get out the door. Or don't open the door because it's 3 a.m. You know, don't, don't make that much noise. Don't panic everybody around you just because you're running a drill at 3 a.m. But there's all kinds of devices you can get. I wouldn't put, you know, full, like, medieval wooden planks across the door. But there's things you can and should do to keep people out of your house in the first place. And, you know, you can look up. It's out of the scope of this video, but how to not make your house a target. And, like, cover windows so people can't see in. You know, maybe leave a light on or have, like, a night light. I've got little, like, $3 contact brake magnetic alarms, 110 decibel on every window and every door. Uh, I would do just the windows if um, you have people who might come in that you forgot they were out late at night. Those cheapy ones can only be disarmed by a switch on the inside. There's no way to come into the house from the outside and then disarm them. You will light them off and wake up everybody. So, you know, hey. But also, don't get some cloud-based thing. Don't get some box solution. I'm not a fan of that at all. It's just like a scam to have a monthly fee. And yeah, oh, they'll call 911 and check on you and this and that, report to the, you know, in the cloud into your cell phone. And if your house floods, like those are cool. Like Simply Safe is pretty good, but it's a giant privacy thing. Who knows who can get into those cameras? The lesser, cheaper brands can be hacked. I would just rather have a totally offline, just, well, still box solution, but like purely electrical. You know, maybe lo local, Wi Fi, eh, okay, but nothing in the cloud, nothing with servers, because if it goes offline, you got to replace everything. Plus, like I said, massive privacy and spying risks. They could be listening to every word you say and selling it to an advertisement or the government or, you know, just no thanks. If you're going to do a security system, just alarms, window break alarms, a central little control hub, some offline little server, or just a, a Raspberry Pi running everything and no internet connection. That's, you're miles ahead of everyone. You pay for it once. It's way cheaper. No subscription, nothing. I'm a big, big, big fan of that.
Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with very many brands because I built everything myself in my house, but uh, just shop around, read reviews, you know. So prevent people from getting in in the first place. Don't look like a target. Those kind of go hand in hand, but they are two different things. And then know what to do if you see somebody their back is turned, if it's too dark, if it's this, is that. When will I turn on the flashlight? When will I not? You can even just go through your house after, you know, after dark and think, well, okay, let's pretend there's somebody in here. Pretend I heard something here. Okay, where should I stop? What door frame should I, you know, walk through or not walk through? How do I open the door? Am I going to do it from the side or not? Now, you can look up, like, how to clear a house. There's a billion and one videos on YouTube about that. A lot of them are pretty good, too. They're like, how the police do it. And, I mean, why would you do it that much differently? But they have multiple people in body armor, so don't get too caught up in that. Uh, how, to, how to clear a house solo would probably be a good video. And, uh, you know, practice, practice, practice. With the actual gun, too. Obviously, I wouldn't have it loaded even, just in case, you know, because you're thinking about all kinds of other stuff. But, you know, see if you can swing it around. See if it's too heavy for you. See if, you know, oh, I can't actually fire this way because this is in the way. Just take a day or two and do it. I mean, once a year, you're probably good enough. You can do it once a month for all I care. I mean, you're probably going to get out your gun and do dry fire practice in case anyway, you know, just because it, it's cheaper than going to the range. Just trigger pulls, keeping the, keeping the dot on the target, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're going to do that anyway, you might as well... Practice room clearing and, 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 you know, walking through your house at night, too, and, you know, make sure the flashlight batteries still work. That you should check, like, monthly. And if you don't want to spend too much, because, you know, good gun flashlights are really expensive, like 100 plus. I mean, even an Osprey, those are, like, 60, 70. Just put a good flashlight next to it. I got a flashlight review on this channel, I think, for some real cheapy, like, $9 ones from, from uh, China, but they are amazing. They run in 18650s, and those things are very impressive. But it takes a hand off the gun. Uh, you could have the, the overhead one, too. You could buy really good, really bright. I have two of them. They are insane. Uh, little like strap it to your head things with uh, multiple LEDs and it runs on two 18650s. I think I paid 16 bucks for it and just waited a month for it to ship from overseas. Yeah, that thing is blinding. It is ridiculous and it, it's hands-free. It's cheaper than a gun light, but it is one more thing to grab. But it's a nice thing to have, though. If you're just going to go do some work outside at night, it's just nice to have, you know? I love dual purpose, not just buying something and putting it in a drawer and you're never going to use it except in an emergency. I'm not saying that's bad, like a water filter or something, but uh, if I can get double the use out of my money, I'm, I'm going to get it. So lastly, let's talk ammunition types. So for shotguns, a slug, why would you do that? You, you've basically got a cannon, and if you miss, you miss. The whole point of a shotgun is shot. So number four uh, buckshot, that's, that's my choice because it's still going to kill a person, but it's a little bit less penetrating through walls. It's about as safe as you're going to get as far as buckshot and the low recoil stuff is even better. Birdshot. I've seen it put an absolute hole in drywall or wood from many feet away, but I've also seen it completely bounce off of just like cardboard at like 50 feet. And then there's different weights. I don't hunt ducks or, or any anything flying, so I don't really know that much about birdshot, unfortunately, other than, yeah, from three feet away, it's basically a slug. It's it, Yeah, there are separate little pieces of lead, but it's going to act like a slug. It's going to put a hole clear through someone. So birdshot for home defense, usually pretty good, but there are all kinds of reasons not to use it and all kinds of reasons to use it. People say, oh, it absolutely will not go through a, a wall. That is false. But they say it absolutely won't go through a, a wall like a slug. Well, well, that is generally true. At a certain distance, it'll just bounce off the wall. Okay, but what if there's a threat on your front lawn? Somebody's acting crazy. Well, stay in your house and don't alert them to your presence. But uh, I don't know. In some scenario where you would have to take the gun outside your house, it is useless after a certain pretty medium distance. If you're going to put birdshot in your gun for home defense because you're really worried about wall penetration, but you still think you can shoot somebody, you know, close enough... I would make sure the last shell in the tube is buckshot. In fact, my gun, if I'm not mistaken right now, is four shells of low recoil, number four, and the last one is um, full power, upwards of, I think, like 2,000 FPS, double log buck. Just in case the first couple don't work, or, well, don't pursue fleeing felons, but in case I had to shoot through a car door, I don't know what the scenario would be, but... There's not a strong reason to do it. It's just, well, why have all the same thing? So I've heard of people say, well, the first one I'm going to load is a blank so that it's a warning shot. That I don't agree with at all. That's just stupid. If you're going to fire the gun, fire the gun. And like I said, if they hear one shot, they're like, I'm being shot at. I had no intention to use this gun. It's just a scare tactic. But the homeowner is shooting at me. Now I'm going to return fire. You just made things worse. They probably would have ran off if you wouldn't have fired at them. Maybe. Everything's maybe. There's no, you know, you got to go through these things in your head and train a bit. So beanbag rounds, if you want that to be your first one, sure, it, it can be lethal. Otherwise, it's just going to put the hurting on someone. But what's the point? If you want them to run off, why would you, like, disable their leg or break a rib? I, I guess you could call that. It's, it's the warning shot that actually hits them. And generally, a beanbag will not go through a wall. So there's a little bit of an argument there. But 
if I'm firing at someone, it's because I want them dead. It's because they are a lethal threat to me. Otherwise, I'm not going to fire at them. So if you're like, well, if if they if they don't have a weapon, I'm just going to send a beanbag their way. Well, you could break their skull and kill them. So it's kind of the same thing. You can't say, oh, no, beanbags are 100% less lethal. They absolutely are not 100% less lethal. And that goes double or triple for really short ranges. Uh, what else? Like, flechette rounds? Why? Yeah, they won't go through a wall. Okay. People say, oh, I'm going to do all rock salt because it hits the person that goes into the skin and burns. Okay, cool, but the stopping power of that is nothing, so you're really just going to piss them off. While still also getting charged for using potentially a lethal weapon on them. Uh, I don't know. Dragon's Breath! No! Don't use flaming magnesium inside of a house! <laughs> but it will set them on fire and they won't be able to return fire if they're on fire. Do I even need to explain the 12 different reasons that that's not a good idea? I don't know, bolo rounds? Those are just silly. Rubber? First of all, they can be lethal, and secondly, that's gonna bounce around. Those home defense slug buckshot hybrid rounds, you know exactly which ones I'm talking about, probably. They're really heavily marketed, but they're really heavily idiotic, stupid, and pointless. Every test I've ever seen, they're just like, why did these exist? Don't buy these. It's like three balls on the front and then a, a, a underpowered slug behind it. It'll just go through your walls in a slightly different pattern. A at like 15 yards, it just kept missing people by the shoulder. Those are just stupid. There's really no exotic shotgun rounds that I can think of that are better for home defense than just small buckshot or birdshot, whatever your preference is. But if you're going to go pistol, let's just assume it's a 9mm, because that's where you get, you know, the most, like, wide amount of weird exotic ammo. There's this thing called, like, a guard dog round. I'm not sure if they still make them. Probably not. They probably went bankrupt, because, well, spoiler alert, they don't do what they say. Once again, you can find this video on YouTube. Somebody did a guard dog test. Uh, what they are is they're, like, kind of thick, but, like, plate metal, so not solid metal, around a gel. So most of the bullet is gel, and then there's, like, a, a, a collapsible plate steel or letter whatever it is on the outside if it hits a person it's like yeah you just got hit by a bullet and it'll actually smush a little bit so it acts a little bit kind of like a hollow point very interesting so they're they're for home defense and they say under penetration right on it like this is safe for walls unfortunately what somebody did is build a wall and shoot it through it and they found out it would go i think it was like 14 inches into ballistic gel whereas a hollow point nine mil went like 19 well I talked to your wife and kids, and they said they don't want a bullet going any amount of inches into them. So, yeah, those guard dog rounds are, are crap, and it seems like every couple years, some new brand will pop up saying, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a polymer, it's a this, it's a this plated that. It's everyone that I've ever seen goes straight through a wall. And if it doesn't, it might not have the, the structural integrity to actually harm a person. And if it's not a hollow point, it's already a pistol caliber. You're not going to have very high stopping power. Now, I'm not saying in order to incapacitate a person, it has to have the power to go through a wall. That's not quite true, but it's pretty close, and a lot of these products are pretty darn gimmicky. So the one thing you should never do with any rifle or pistol, besides just generally not using a rifle indoors, is never use full metal jacket, because that is just one hard piece of lead, and it's going to go through a wall better than a hollow point. Hollow points hit something, they curl over, and they drag. The difference isn't significant, but if you want to, like, just barely not go through two walls, whereas a full metal jacket would go through two walls, there you go, kind of fringe scenario, but hey, you can never be too safe. And then also hollow points have way more stopping power, way higher lethality, they hurt somebody way more, they make a bigger wound cavity, faster bleeding, they just, if you're going to shoot a person in a self-defense scenario, it's going to have to be hollow point almost regardless of the scenario. So always, always, always get those. So I would get really good high, um... Curl rate, I know that's not the actual term. Expansion ratio, is that what it is? Whatever it's called, like a really good expansion. Buy that bullet. And then as far as the casing behind the bullet, nickel. I mean, if you're going to store it in a house and just kind of whatever, you know, yeah, it's probably more climate controlled than storing in a garage. But um, the nickel, I don't know if they're nickel plated or solid nickel, but the, the, the casings tend to, that, that are nickel, they're just the shiny ones. They tend to stand up a little bit better and warp a little bit less and be a little bit more weatherproof. Generally a little bit more expensive than brass casings, but they're better. If all you can find is brass, that's fine. Steel for home defense? It likes to jam, it likes to damage your gun. That's all I'm going to say. Do not save $2 because you got some steel case stuff and then you're going to regret it later when you actually have to use your gun. That's actually what's in my 9mm, just my carry gun. It's uh, nickel casings and a really high expansion, good proven, good brand, reliable uh, hollow point. So rifles just generally no. Even like the military and special ops and SWAT have massive problems with overpenetration with rifles. I mean, if there's an active shooter, they're going to show up with rifles and, and, and some kind of long gun, okay? That's just what it's going to be. Shotguns are great too, but like... Rifles are very pinpoint, and you don't want to get closer than you have to to a, a deadly threat. 
I mean, even a fairly recent video I saw, they stopped a, a, an active shooter because security already had gotten shot. Plus, I think they're unarmed, which it's, it's a glorified decoration at that point. It's security theater. But they showed up, and because nobody else in the store stopped the person because nobody was carrying a gun, I could tell you all about what I think of that. They had to put a rifle into him from a fairly good distance, went right through him into like a dressing changing room for trying on clothes and hit a 14 year old girl and killed her. Rifles are extremely dangerous indoors because you don't know what's behind you. And in a house, like a small house or an apartment, you're going into your neighbor's apartment, if not your neighbor's house, just don't use rifles. But you might think, oh, but I need the aim. I need the, this, I can buy a short barrel. I can get this, I can get that. Well, and you can buy subsonic. I totally forgot to say that in the, in the what ammo to buy section. Subsonic, there's not going to be that, that supersonic pop. They're built for suppressors. If you can afford a suppressor, get one. Yeah, it's going to make your gun longer, but my God, a suppressed pistol. Just forget about the ears. You don't need ear protection with, well, in an, in, in an emergency situation with a, a suppressor, a good suppressor. And subsonic ammunition. It won't be movie quiet probably, except for 22, but like a 9mm subsonic hollow point through a suppressor on like a mid-length barrel of a pistol. It's going to be quiet enough that you don't see stars and have ears ringing, okay? It's going to be loud. I wouldn't go to the range and say, I don't need your pro and, you know, do that. You'll probably damage your hearing. It's still loud. But subsonic ammunition, even with ear protection in, it's going to be quieter. Also, it's lower energy. So you want to talk about less penetration. Now, subsonic 9mm, usually it's the same amount of energy, and they just make the bullet heavier, which is going to affect your aim. It's just FYI. I've seen subsonic 22 that's 42 or 45 grain when normally it's uh, 32 to 40. And like a 20 inch rifle, your barrel, like uh, the, the rifling, the spin and how many twists per, per foot and stuff, you are going to affect the accuracy if all you ever fire is that. Especially if your gun's sighted in for full metal jacket rounds or standard velocity or really, really fast velocity 22. But if the person's 15 feet away from you in a house, I don't think you're going to throw it off that much by running like ultra heavy ammo that also is underloaded on powder. But it's going to have less of an impact and it's going to hit less hard and have less stopping power. So just know that. I know somebody said they got plus P's in their home defense gun, which is high pressure, high velocity. And yes, they checked if their gun could take it. It could, but like you're basically doing, I think like 10, 20% more impact energy with a nine millimeter while changing nothing. It's just like overloaded rounds. Kind of cool, but those are going to over penetrate through a wall. So it's kind of the opposite of what you want. Also 20% more energy on a pistol. I believe I said, isn't it 500% more energy getting hit by a rifle? And then it like goes up from there. It's either a rifle or it's not. Okay, don't dick around with powers. And the other thing is like, you hit somebody with a 22, they they're going to be hurting. You hit somebody with a 380, they they're going to be hurting. So a slightly slower, heavier, roughly the same energy, maybe a little bit lower, 10, 20, 30% lower energy, 9 millimeter, is still going to stop someone, especially if you shoot them multiple times. And it's already not a rifle, you know? So it's like, if you're going to go slower than a rifle and not just absolutely blow somebody's arm clear off their body or sever their si spinal cord with like a... 223 or immediately explode their heart i mean rifle rounds are not pretty if you're already doing something less than that i mean you might as well be safer if you got kids in the house i'd probably go subsonic hollows i really would and if you got roommates a, a significant other yeah i would generally recommend that as the pretty ideal stuff but not for shotguns shotguns are a whole other world just the pressure wave coming out the barrel i i don't think it really matters if it's um subsonic or not and strapping a shotgun grade suppressor on your shotgun is going to make it ridiculous length so then we're back into oh you're banging it on everything and can't really maneuver also i may have mentioned the suppressors are unbelievably expensive so they're worth it they're cool subsonic with the suppressor you can skip the ear pro but like eh, i mean if you got the money you got the time it takes like nine ten months to get one but then you have to buy a gun that has a threaded barrel but as I was saying before, if you're not going to go shotgun, rifle, or pistol, you want, like, the, the next ideal or as good, but for more money, which is why it wasn't number one on my uh, list, home defense overall solution, it would probably be a, a 9mm or other pistol caliber rifle, typically called a carbine. There's a little difference and not all carbines are pistol caliber, but generally when people say that, that's what they mean. So I used to have it, I sold it in the height of the, uh, the gun shortage for... Uh, roughly triple what I paid for it. So don't give me too much crap for this, but it was a kel Sub-2000 Gen 2 9mm Glock Mag compatible, okay? You can't get much of a better gun than that. The iron sights are perfectly sufficient to hit someone. It's pretty, you know, close up. You can get it real close to your cheek, which means you're not, you know, way out there with a long barrel. It's like the minimum legal length and it folds. So you can put it in, I think, like a 19-inch case. You just fold it out. Now, to fold it out, then get the mag in it, 
I could run the 10 round flush mag, but you're going to see why I don't want you to do that in a second. And like fold it out, get the mag in and then pull the bolt back. And my God, do you need to be like Thor himself to pull that back? I, like I'm pretty strong, but damn, I had trouble doing that even with my left hand. I had to kind of practice like, should I angle it here? Should I prop it against my chest to do it? I found the best way to do it. And you can't just do it in midair, you know, movie style, like MP5 where you just, oh, pull it. Only real drawback to that gun that I saw. Well, I guess the other drawback is that it's a Caltech, but Compact storage, it can take 33 round Glock mags, of which I had four. One was all hollow points. It's quieter than a rifle, but easier to aim than a pistol. It can basically fit in a large pistol case. It takes the same ammo as my carry pistol. I mean, you want to talk about a home defense gun, I, other than the fact that I kept it in my car as a car defense gun, pretty much, yeah, it was a home defense gun. And those are 33 round aftermarket, but still pretty reliable, good, you know, metal, well-vetted, well-built, uh, high capacity Glock mags, because you know, it's for Glocks. It's not some weird, obscure third party. Oh, look, I put a 50 round drum on my random, you know, SIG nine millimeter or something. Those will jam. High cap stuff tends to jam. Different pressures, they don't feed evenly. The drum one's got multiple uh, moving parts, not worth it. They're, they're just generally a bad idea all around. Also, they're really expensive. But these high caps that fit in there, I've never had a single jam with them. I will say hollow points in a 33, I didn't have the budget to ever just go blow that at the range, but uh, I did 10 and I think it jammed on the eighth shot. So there is that, that's another, another factor to think about. But you get 33 rounds, which is right up there with any rifle, if not exceeding it. Although I got 40 rounders from my AR-15, so yeah, okay, right up there with it. It's quieter, it's lighter, it has less wall penetration. It fits in a smaller area. It's safe. It doesn't fire while folded. I mean, it's just good. And they make all kinds of short little nine millimeters. They can make, you can get an extended pistol. It's just classified as a, a generic gun or a pistol for legal classifications. But really it's just like a short barrel rifle that fires nine mil. I think those are wonderful. I mean, if you're going to put some in your house and you, the space isn't really too much of a thing as far as where you're hiding it. Yeah, I'd get like a mid-sized one over a pistol any day, because why wouldn't you? Now, if you're going to buy a pistol, keep it around the house because you don't have a concealed carry license, but in case some big, huge thing goes down and you're going to basically, against the law, carry it because there might not be rule of law at that point, but you still want to conceal it just in case, well, I would say if you're going to plan ahead that much, go get the concealed carry license. I mean, if we're all preparing ahead, like... You know, breaking the law is not good. You could lose your gun rights. Don't do it. Unless you absolutely have to, or there's an emergency scenario, and even then it might stand up in court. Just saying. But if you want the, like, it's going to stay in my house, but if I had to carry it, I can. So it's going to be a thin, light, little eight round, whatever. Okay, I get that. You know, dual purpose kind of. Get it all done with one purchase. But for pure home defense, it, it's going to be either a shotgun with buckshot because it fires basically pistol caliber at an equivalent weight, an equivalent impact, and an equivalent speed and energy, but all at once because it's buckshot and you probably won't need more than five shells, but the reload speed is really slow. I don't know. If you think four people are going to break into your house, shotgun's going to be rough. If that's a common scenario in your head or some kind of evidence or with where you live, then I would probably say, yeah, get a pistol caliber short rifle. And then put hollow points in it. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is frangible ammo. Um, I, I didn't want to put this in the main what type of ammo to buy section because I've heard everything across the board and in between. It will go through walls. It won't go through walls. It will go through a person. It won't go through a person. What it is, frangible is like powder, usually metal powder. It's usually lead just kind of compressed together and it falls apart really easily. There's all kinds of different types. I'm not even familiar with how they're... Um, built at the factory, but I, I don't know if it's like glue or it's just pressure or if it's chemicals. I think some are built with silicates, AKA sand. You know, there's all kinds of different ones. There's the paint rounds that are waxed with paint, but they still hurt. Uh, those are less lethal. They're usually for shooting at people. Basically turns your gun into a paintball gun, but they're still not that safe. They're still usually used for training and usually it's, it's just like marker ammo is what they call it. But frangible is like, okay, we're going to do live fire drills. If somebody gets hit, they're going to be hurt and they do it in full body armor. This is like SWAT or police training right here. They're going to buy frangible ammo because when it hits a hard surface, it just turns into a big poof cloud. Okay. It's not a flak cannon, but like it, it won't ricochet. The whole point is it doesn't ricochet. I've heard of them using chalk. I've heard of all kinds of stuff, but the, the weight and the recoil is going to be more accurate with true metal lead frangible ammo. Some frangible ammo is actually marketed as home defense, and that's one of the few that I actually agree with. Now, I've seen a couple videos where allegedly frangible stuff almost point blank went through a wall, so nothing's perfect, but I've also seen it not make it all the way through a standard, like, house wall from, like, 20 feet. 
But I've also seen frangible ammo into ballistic gel, and it, it got into it without really breaking apart. Because it, it's, you know, your body isn't made out of metal. Uh, maybe you could hit a ribbon, it would bounce off or something. I don't know. It's all these, like, it's not going to be as good as a hollow point just screaming into somebody. But it's still a gun, and they're still getting hit by a bullet. It's It seems to be it's somewhere in there, and there's so many different brands, and nobody buys it, and there's so few tests with it. The last time I researched it pretty heavily on YouTube, I just couldn't find a consistent answer, and it, it seemed to come down to the brand differences in the gun. And they weren't all 9mm frangible either. Now, frangible rifle ammo, you might think, oh, best of all worlds, I can have a rifle, and then I can use it with normal, or I can use it indoors for this and that and have different mags. I'm going to buy frangible rifle ammo. I had heard that they like to crack and fail and ruin your barrel and jam and that kind of stuff, because the amount of pressure in the initial, like, acceleration from a rifle is insane compared to a pistol and a lot of stuff that's just like glued or compressed together lead or however they do it can't stand up to that also i'm not sure how frangible ammo uh stores if you gotta like waterproof it oxygen proof it that kind of stuff and if it has an expiration because they tend to just buy it and use it but i can imagine like some kind of polymer or some kind of glue would fall apart over time so I, just, I don't know enough about it other than it is a viable option from what I've heard. If you live in the middle of a populated apartment building, I would almost just say you're so liable. Even if it goes through one wall, let alone two, you are in such a risk of hitting someone and you are liable for that. Even if somebody broke in with the expressed, written, signed, dated, and notarized, like, I'm going to kill this person note in their wallet with like a, a text on their phone saying, I'm going to come kill you. It still doesn't matter if you fire at them three times and it goes, you miss one and it goes through the wall and hits the person next to you, you're still liable. At least civilly, if not criminally, usually criminally. So if I lived in an apartment building, I'm probably going with frangible and just, oh, well, it's the best I can do safely. I think number four buckshot in a small apartment or even a midsize apartment and apartment walls tend to be very, very, very thin. Yeah, it's, it's really dangerous. You would have to just constantly train to have an awareness of where your neighbor's bed is in their apartment, which do you even know that? Why would you know that? Or just say, I'm always going to jump up on something higher and shoot downward if you're on the floor and there's no basement. Like, there's some things you can do. Like, oh, I'm always going to angle it into the hallway and just hope it doesn't go through multiple walls. I would just, I would just buy frangible. I would research it, but it, it's a pretty decent option. So, I mean, if you can, go get yourself a Keltec Sub 2000. They're back down now. I'm really glad I sold it when I did. I sold it like a year ago or a year and a half. It was somewhere around uh, COVID meets Antifa when people were buying stuff like that from auctions because no gun stores had them. Hey, if I got enough views on this video, I'll buy one back. Hey, you know, support the channel. Like, subscribe. I'll be honest with you. I kind of want that gun back. But, um, you know, frangible ammo, 33 rounder, 10 round hollow point as a backup or something because it comes with one. You get that all done with the high caps and everything and a nice flashlight on the front. Oh my gosh, I had like a $70 flashlight on the front of mine. It was set up, dude. That gun was amazing. I just bought it for fun though. It was just like, oh, whatever. I've got a shotgun. I got a pistol. I, I'm not, I wasn't intending to use it for home defense. It wasn't really set up for that. I kept it in my car. I'm like, it's the gun I least need because I just keep a pistol in the car now, whatever. Like, it's kind of hard to fold it out in a car. It was an interesting idea, but it was like, if I got to get out and shoot my way out of angry protesters that are firing at me or throwing molotovs at me okay it was the ideal gun for that but it's also really good for home defense i had that covered so i sold it but man if you guys pick that up oh or something similar and if you've actually got a really good short carbine or something like that that you would like to recommend down in the comment section absolutely do it tell me the, the model what you like and why or don't tell me tell everybody else because that's who it's for and you can do that right after you're done leaving your angry cut about how revolvers are the greatest thing and your grandpa and this war and that, the West and all these other drastically uninformed things. I get so many pissy comments on these gun videos. I, I just delete them, but you guys should see them. It's amazing. And uninformed people who aren't scared to share their uninformed opinions. It's almost like we're on the internet or something. But I'll tell you, all the info in this video is good, but I, you know, I'm not, it's not like I own a gun shop. It's not like I've been a, a firearms trainer for like 30 years. So if you got something to add, like, hey, you didn't uh, know about this, or you didn't mention this, or you neglected to say this, or this is a good option, or that's a good thing. My comment sections on these videos are usually crowdsourcing information central. It's like a Wikipedia page, except accurate, not biased, and full of cooler people. But that has been your little one-hour podcast guide to um, home defense, weapons, and ammo, and everything in between. What to do, what not to do, and, uh, you know, like I said, go research the laws, because that's the one thing I really didn't hit on other than telling you to do it. So I thought I'd throw a little reminder in there. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.